Good morning, church. Thank you, Ron. Ron, uh, I shared earlier, Ron to me is like the wise version of Ryan Page. <laughs> Don't leave, Ryan. It's not personal. It's not personal. But I was watching Ron give the announcements, and I'm like, that's, it's like a, a more seasoned Ryan, you know? So, uh, no, we love Ryan. He, he's got some wisdom, too, I think. Uh, no, if you have your Bible, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 9. It's great to see all of you here. I know that we have uh, a lot of family and friends that have come for Caleb's baptism after this service today. Thank you for coming. I know it means the world to him that you're here to celebrate, and we're going to celebrate his decision uh, after this service. And so we ask you to hang around for a baptism after the service today. Years ago, Leslie and I were uh, at Willowbrook Mall. We were doing some shopping. I don't remember the occasion, but I do remember seeing this little kid walking down the, the hallway there between all the stores and kind of being what doing, doing kid stuff, you know, kind of weaving in and out of people and just exploring, looking at all the windows. And then he got a little far away from his parents, and all of a sudden he made this face like, and I realized that his mom had him on one of those kid leashes. You know what I'm talking about? And I have to, I'm just going to confess, I was super judgy that day. Like, and I thought, you know, this kid wants to run free, and you've leashed him like a rabid dog in a mall. And I'm like, you know, uh, I, just, I just can't imagine that you do that to a kid. And then, and then we had our own kid, and I'm like, where do you buy those? <laughs> and we need a few on hand in case the other one breaks loose. And you'll hear a little bit more about that later in this message. But uh, I remember that day kind of watching that happen. And we were really close to the, the uh, kids' play area. And the mom turned the corner. And the kid, of course, saw the play stuff. And then the kid got to the play area. And she unclipped his harness. And then the kid went crazy, you know, and did what kids do. He jumped on all the slides and was sliding down and rolling around and made instant friends on the playground, right? And uh, so it was really kind of cool to see that. Uh, but I will admit that I think it's a little bit of, a, of an indictment on me as a pastor and as a leader. I think it's also a picture of what I've seen in the church, and it's this, that churches can be very controlling of people. Churches, unfortunately, can put people in harnesses and in places where they won't succeed. Sometimes the heart behind it is actually a good heart from the standpoint of we see people that God has gifted and called and we see their potential to do great things for God and we want them to be used in that way but the bad part is we get a little selfish you know it's like don't call them to the mission field we need them here and so today I want to get to the final part of our journey in our make disciples series to the final step of our discipleship process and that is releasing to multiply so i want to just walk you through it for those who have missed it we've been explaining and kind of laying out for the church what our process will be for discipleship here at the brook and so a disciple is someone who obviously is a believer and so the first thing that we do is we share the gospel with those who are not believers and the hope is that they come to faith in Christ, they see him for who he is and what he came to do to save them from their sins, that he died, was buried, and rose again. And so we share the gospel, and then we hope that our disciples then, in turn, share the gospel with those who don't know Christ. And today we're going to celebrate with Caleb. He kind of makes the transition as a believer to say publicly through baptism, I've placed my faith in what Christ has done for me on the cross. And then we have said that it, as you grow as a disciple, once you've believed the gospel, then we want to encourage you, as Jesus did, to live in community. That the Christian life is not to be lived on an island and by yourself, but we were designed for relationship with God and a relationship with people. And so we want to encourage you to live in biblical community in the body of Christ. And then the next step is to build connections. First, your connection with God through personal worship. One of the sad things that I've seen in the church uh, through my years is that we treat the church like a mama bird does a baby bird the pastor studies all week and everyone opens their mouths and papa bird feeds the baby the food and then they are satisfied hopefully for a week that is not what growing in christ is 
You need to be building your personal connection with God in a daily walk with Him. Your pastor is not the person that needs to hold your hand through every part of life. You're to hold the hand of God and Jesus as He walks you through these parts of your life. And so building a connection with God by growing in your relationship with Him, but then also building a connection with His body, the church, through service, finding your place of gifting, finding where God has called you, and then saying, God, I want to use that gift for your honor and for your glory. And I was so overwhelmed last week when Jonathan issued the call for those who feel called to serve in ministry. I was overwhelmed by how many of you responded and said, this is where God has gifted me, and this is where God is calling me. And so I want to just thank you for having your heart open to the Lord to say, I just want to be used. Because that gets us to the next step in our journey, and that's equipping in purpose. We want to walk alongside you. We want to help you grow in that, in your faith. And so one of the reasons that our high school students are in here today is we want to equip them for the work of ministry. We believe that they have gifts and they can be used of God to build the body of Christ. So we want to walk along with people and equip them in purpose and then get to the last part of that, of that process, and that is to release God's people to multiply. So I want to begin in Matthew chapter 9 today to talk a little bit about uh, what it means to be released to multiply. Back in 2002, God began to work in my life about 21 years ago. Hard to believe I'm that old, but about 21 years ago, I was serving as a youth pastor at my dad's church. And through a conversation with a friend of mine who was telling me about his church and a need there for a college ministry, God began to really pull my heart to begin serving in this other church. And that was a very difficult decision for me. The church that I was serving in was the church that I was basically born into. My parents were going to church when I was before I was born. It was the church I was saved at. It was the church that I was baptized at. It's the church where I was called to the ministry in that church, in that youth ministry. I was licensed for the ministry through that church, and I was going to be ordained through that church. So this church was everything that I had known for my entire life up into my early 20s, but God was calling me to go and to answer his call at another church. And it was so difficult for me when I knew with clarity that's what God wanted. I'd been talking to my dad about it, and then I made the decision, Leslie and I were married at the time, we made the decision that this is what God had called us to. And I remember going into my dad's office, being so worried about giving him that news because it was a smaller church. We had a pretty large youth group, and I was a really key leader in that church. But I knew without any doubt that God was calling me to answer this call to go serve in this other church. So I told my dad, we shed some tears together, we prayed together, and then before I actually left the church to go and serve in the new place, my dad wrote me a letter. And that letter is still in my office. I didn't bring it because I'd cry if I read it to you. But in that letter, my dad wrote a letter releasing me to multiply. And in that letter, he told me how proud he was of me to see me grow the way that I have and the way that I've served. And then he encouraged me. He said, son, I know you're going to go there and continue to serve the Lord. I'm so proud of you and the things that you've done. And he wrote that letter, and I read it. I was crying, you know, just a total mess. I won't leave, Dad. I'll stay here, right? I mean, that's where I was. But it was an amazing moment because what my dad was doing was in so many ways kind of unclipping the harness and saying, I've poured into you what I can, and I know that God is with you, and God is going to use you in the ministry to do amazing things for him. I keep that letter on my desk, and from time to time I'll pull it out and just read it to be reminded of the beauty of when you are released to multiply as a disciple of Jesus Christ. When you read the gospel accounts of Jesus as he discipled his disciples— we said that we wanted to try to mirror that in the way that we built out discipleship here. And as you read the stories of Jesus, Jesus did a few things, and I want you to write these down. Sometimes he would tell the disciples, watch me do the work. And I'll spell these out in just a moment. Then there were other times where he said, do the work and I'll watch you. So the first thing was, watch me do the work. The second one was, do the work and I'll watch you. And then the third aspect of it was, go and do the work. So I'll give you some examples. In John chapter 2, Jonathan talked about that miracle at the wedding in Cana. Jesus and his disciples are there, and the, the wine runs out at the wedding, and so Mary, the mother of Jesus, brings that to Jesus' attention. There's a conversation that ensues, and then Jesus turns the water into wine. The disciples didn't do anything. 
They just watched what Jesus did. Jesus used some servants to fill up the, the barrels that were there, but Jesus did the miracle and the disciples watched. And John records this in John chapter 2 and verse 11. It'll be on the screen. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples, what? Believed in him. So when Jesus did the work of ministry and the disciples observed it, two things happened. I want you to write these down. Jesus was revealed and people believed. So when Jesus did it and the disciples had no part of it, Jesus was revealed and people believed. Now, there are other miracles. For example, the feeding of the 5,000 that's told in multiple gospel accounts. You remember the story that there's a great crowd around Jesus, and the only responsible person on the field that day was a little boy who brought two fishes and five loaves. And, of course, that wasn't enough for the crowd that had gathered around. And in Luke's gospel, it, it records this. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, and Jesus said a blessing over them. Then Jesus broke the loaves, and he gave them to who? To the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied, and what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. And John, in his record of this event, in John chapter 6, wrote this, When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet that had been talked about of old in the Old Testament. This is indeed the prophet, the Messiah, who has come into the world. So when Jesus turned the water into wine, Jesus was revealed and people believed. When Jesus did the work of ministry with and through the disciples, what happened? Jesus was revealed and people believed. Do you see it? And then the last thing that we see in Scripture is Jesus telling his disciples, now go and do the work of ministry. We call it the Great Commission of Matthew 28, Mark 16, John 21, when he sends them out acts chapter 1 we find that in luke chapter 24 jesus saying go and do the work now that last phrase of our vision is so important it's being released to multiply in that we're saying that there's a job to do and god is releasing us to multiply to the ends of the earth but before we get to acts chapter 1 which is where we're going to end today I want to go to Matthew chapter 9, a fairly well-known passage if you've been around church. In Matthew 9 and verse 35, I want us to read just a few verses together. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. His harvest. In verse 35, we find the message of our mission. Jesus went about proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Now, some translations render this preaching the gospel of the kingdom, but that word preaching or proclaiming, it carries the idea of heralding. It's making an announcement. It might be something that someone would do to announce the presence of a dignitary or a king. And Jesus, everywhere he went, was heralding the good news of God's kingdom. I want to just say this to you here. The message of God's kingdom is a message of good news. And maybe the message of God's kingdom for you has been something different. Maybe the message of God and his kingdom and the church that is supposed to carry that message of the kingdom is bad because you've seen hypocritical Christians. Or maybe the church or Christians have hurt you. And so the message of Jesus is not good news to you. But when Jesus preached his message was the message of the good news of God's kingdom. That was the message of his mission. I'm a, an assistant coach at Tomball Little League, and it's going to be a rough season. I'll just say that right now. 
our team is uh, not super great. We're not uh, going to be called up by the Astros in their farm system anytime soon. We might be called to be farmers, but it ain't going to be baseball farm system, I'll tell you that. First two games, we got annihilated. I mean, it, it, was, it was bad. We almost waved the white flag of surrender. It's a tough, tough couple of games. And so yesterday we played, and boy, when you have to go to a bunch of kids after a Little League game when it, they just got beat, it's a tough meeting. Sometimes there's tears, there's frustration, but the look on their faces is awful because there's really not anything good to say because we do play to win, right? Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, y'all playing to lose? We don't. We, I always tell the kids, like, winning is not everything, but losing ain't fun. I'll tell you that right now. So it's not everything, but we like to win here. But anyway, yesterday we, we the bats came alive. Our defense was really good, and we were up, I think it was like 16 to 8 going into the last inning. And I'm like, yes, man, we're going to get our first win of the season. And then the other team started coming back, and I'm like, oh, boy. I mean, I could just feel it. And I, in my mind, I'm getting the image of these sad faces after the game. How could we have lost 16 to 8? And I'm like, I really don't know how we could have done that. But we did it. And they kept getting hit after hit. Bases loaded. Our kid was struggling a little bit. And, and kids were struggling. And then this kid hits just a laser out to the outfield, clears the bases, 16 to 15, man on second, two outs. And this kid gets up that looks like he got his birth certificate when he was 12. <laughs> He's basically could be graduating college by body type. And I just snarling up there, just nasty hitter. And I'm like, he had already hit a bomb earlier in the game. I'm outside, well, that's over. You know, like, sorry, kids, there are losers in life, and we are it today. So anyway, kid gets up, and, and, uh, and he hits just a dribbler to the pitcher. Pitcher picks it up, throws it to first, and you'd have thought we won the World Series. I mean, it was and it was so different to be able to go behind the dugout like, hey, we got good news here. We won. Jesus is good news. I mean, he is good news that God's kingdom is at hand. That is the message that we preach. The good news of the kingdom is that the kingdom is near, salvation is near, and that God's promises are true. That God had promised through the prophets that the Savior would come, and that promise has been fulfilled in Jesus and the message of the good news of the kingdom is that healing is near. We find that in verse 35, that everywhere that Jesus went, he preached the message of good news and healing followed the ministry and the message of Jesus. And in verse 36, we find the heart though. Here's the heart of the mission, that everywhere that Jesus went, he saw people and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep being harassed and helpless sheep with no shepherd the words there in the greek it means to be cut to the to the bone to the core and to be discarded everywhere jesus looked he saw brokenness and he saw people desperately needing hope one of my favorite scriptures to read at at a funeral is psalm 23 the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. But that is not a description of the life of someone that doesn't know Christ. Everywhere Jesus looked, he didn't see people as having a shepherd. He saw them as sheep having no shepherd. And they were broken and they were discarded and they were tossed aside even by religious leaders. And that's why Jesus said in verse 37, there's a harvest and that harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. One of my favorite things to do growing up was go visit my grandpa up in East Texas. I've shared before that he had a little garden behind his house. And he would plant, plant rows of corn and there'd be tomato plants. And we used to love to pick purple hole peas with him. And I love when, when my big daddy, that's what we called him, big daddy would say, let's go out and pick some corn. And you'd stand there. One of the coolest things is the, is the rows. I just love to see the rows. But you'd stand there and you'd look down those rows of corn and you could actually see on the stalk, you could see the husks of the corn covered up, right? The ears of corn. And it was so wonderful when you could hit that just at the right time. You could look down those rows and you could see all that harvest of corn that was just waiting for you to pick. I don't like tomatoes. 
but I love picking tomatoes with him. And you would go and you could see all the tomatoes hanging on the plant. And some of them were green. Some of them were green turning into red. But there was a beautiful thing when you'd look down those rows and it would just be red tomato after red tomato. And you were going to go and harvest those. When we look at the world and the culture that we live in, we see a broken world. We see a world that is detaching itself from truth. And we look at that and we get discouraged. When Jesus looks at the harvest, he says it's ripe for the picking. The harvest is plentiful. The needs are everywhere. All these things that we see online with our kids and our students, those are all simply cries for people that need heat, cries of people that need healing from the brokenness inside of them. And Jesus says the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few. I want you to underline that word few, not in your Bible, but in your heart. The harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. Could it be that the statistics about church culture and the decline of the American church has very little to do with the lostness of the world and it has more to do with the laborers inside the church? The harvest is plentiful. It was plentiful in the first century, and it's plentiful in our day today. But the laborers are few. When I was in the fire department, you would make a fire call. When, when, you're, when you would be dispatched to a fire call, they would typically dispatch a first alarm. That would be three to four engine trucks, depending on different variables, two ladder trucks, a district chief, and then some kind of EMT or EMS division, whether it be an ambulance or a paramedic unit, whatever it was, that would be what's called the first alarm or the first box. When you would show up on the scene, the first captain or officer on scene would assess the scene. If there was way too much fire, if it was, for example, an apartment building and multiple units were engulfed or they had shared attic spaces, then they would call what's called a second box or a second alarm. On the fire scene, if a firefighter gets trapped and they radio on the radio, Mayday, the guidelines of HFD are to immediately call for the next alarm. So if you're at a three-alarm fire and a firefighter gets tra uh, trapped, they immediately dispatch more units. Every time they pull a box or pull another alarm, they are multiplying the number of people and units who are on the scene. To give you perspective of 9-11 for those who were alive at, at that time, on 9-11 there were 214 uh, units dispatched to the World Trade Center fires. That's about five times a five alarm fire. A normal house fire is three engines, two ladders, and a district chief. Each alarm multiplies that by that same number. So they pulled 25 alarms and even more to come to the World Trade Center. That's how much fire and how many issues were there. But what you do in the fire on a fire scene is when you look at the issue or the problem on the scene, you decide how many people are we going to need to put that fire out to save property and to save lives. And Jesus says to us, the harvest is plentiful, but the need of the world is greater than the willingness and the availability of the laborers. In essence, what God is doing is, through Jesus is sounding the alarm that the world is ready to be won, but what the world needs is people who are willing to go. In the life of Jesus, he poured into his disciples. He shared with them the message of the kingdom. He, mirror, or he set the example of what that looked like. He showed them what healing looked like. He showed them the heart that they needed to look at others with compassion and to live that out. He showed them what the harvest was and the need of the fields. And he showed them the need of laborers. And that leads us to verse 38. And I want you to read it. The words of Jesus, Therefore, in light of the harvest... In light of the need and the brokenness around us, in light of the sheep who are walking about with no shepherd, therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. To pray earnestly means to plead or to beg. To pray earnestly is your child at the checkout counter at HEB. They see the Skittles, they want the Skittles. And inflation says, 
you can't have the Skittles. You can have the one Skittle that fell out of that packet off the floor, and that's it. The child sees the Skittles, wants the Skittles. You say no. And is that enough for the child? Not on your life. They ask for the Skittles again, and you don't want to sound like a crazy person to all the nice shoppers. <laughs> you can't have the Skittles. I already said no, put them back. And then the voice escalates and calls attention. <laughs> we buy our kids Skittles a lot, but not today, right? And, and that's, that's the pleading and begging. And they, children are relentless. No does not mean no when it comes to Skittles for children. And they beg, and they beg, and they beg, and by the end of the day, you bought a Skittles factory. You just, they just wear you down, and you buy it, right? It's like, just get the whole box. Get the whole box. Stop making a scene, right? Put the food back. We won't eat anything else for the rest of the week, but we'll eat Skittles for dinner, right? What's the last thing that you begged God for? Think about it. What's the last thing that you prayed earnestly to God for. Can we just be honest that most of our prayers are for our benefit? One of our first family vans, we called it the eggplant. It was a thing of beauty. 2000 Toyota Sienna, double sliding doors in the back, didn't have a hubcap, and couldn't keep door handles on it. And the reason for that is we had a child that needed one of those leashes that I mentioned earlier. And they decided, and especially when he got a brother, that these are like monkey bars, these handles on the side, and they tore them off of our minivan. So yes, you could not open the side door of our minivan from the outside. You had to either Dukes of Hazard it and go through the window, right? <laughs> Or you had to basically throw your arm out of socket to push the button that opens it automatically. And so one of my, one of my favorite memories in that van was when we would take uh, Luke up to Schultz Elementary. We'd drop him off. And the kids that are on safety patrol, they go, they come up and they open the door to let the kids out. And it was always amazing when the kid would reach for the door handle and be like, oh. <laughs> and then like in this sign of high class, I push the button like, oh, it's automatic. We don't because we don't need door handles. I can do this button. It's called technology. Look, Google it, right? But I remember sometimes just saying like, man, I w I'd really like to have door handles, and prayed that one time. It's embarrassing. I did pray that because I looked at the Toyota dealer, and to get door handles at a Toyota dealer, we'd have to sell our house and the children. I mean, it was like way too expensive, and so we just said, well, we'll do without it, or we'll go steal them from somebody or whatever. But we beg God for dumb things like that. We beg God for money. We beg God for promotions. I read a quote by a gentleman named David, uh, make sure I get it right here, David Willis. If God answered all of your prayers, would the world look different or just your life? What did Jesus tell his disciples to pray earnestly for? Laborers to go into the Lord's harvest. And that's exactly what Jesus did in Matthew chapter 10. In the first four verses, he mentions the 12 disciples and calls them by name. Verse 5, Then these 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Lost sheep, you hear it? And proclaim as you go, saying, here's the message, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what's the next word of the next verse? Heal the sick. Everything that Jesus did, he sends his disciples, and he says, now you are released to go do it. But I want you to look down to verse 16. It's stunning what Jesus says. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep, in the midst of wolves so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves when i was coaching upward basketball it's a developmental league and i think adam was maybe eight or nine and there was this kid that played on the other team both of his parents played professional basketball his dad walked in the gym and i think he was like six nine six ten and his mom was like six foot five or six i mean tall tall people and their son who was playing against nine-year-olds 
was a monster. He was the tallest kid. I mean, he almost came up to me. I mean, it was unbelievable. And it, in Upward, what you have to do is when you line the kids up, your five players, the coaches get together and you give each kid a wristband. And you're to match the kid up with the person on the other team that's of kind of this, a similar size and skill level. And that way, all the kids are matched up. You don't have like a really good kid against your worst defender, and he's just scoring point after point. Well, this kid was so huge. I just look, I can't remember the kid's name, but we had one kid on our team. He was our tallest kid, and I said, hey, you're it. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. We lined him up and gave him the mess, matching wristbands, and he just looked up the whole time like, oh, my word. And so I was like, all right, good luck. Get out there and do it, you know. And so... <laughs> This kid, with the, the goals were, I think, eight-foot goals. He could almost dunk it standing there like he was that tall. This kid was a monster. So we played the first period, and all the kids come back, and we were losing. And, and uh, that kid says, Coach, is, is he in junior high? That was his question. Like, this kid is so big, he's got to be a sixth grader. And I was like, don't worry about the goatee, buddy. He's only eight. He's good, all right? But how un unimaginable it was for this kid to go out and try to guard this guy, you know? Like, it just, you feel like you're set up for failure right off the bat. Jesus says to his disciples, not, I'm sending you all out as a well-trained soldier in an armored tank. He says, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. You're going to be in danger when you're on mission with me. You're going to have scars in your life. Everything's not going to go the way that you want it. But that's how much Jesus loves the world, that he is willing to put me at risk for those who are outside of his kingdom. And Jesus says, now go. That's what the harvest looks like. The goal of discipleship is not to create Bible Jeopardy champions. The goal of discipleship is not to raise Bible scholars. The goal of studying your Bible is not to know the Bible. The goal of discipleship is to make laborers for the harvest. The reason that we read our Bible is not so that we win Bible trivia. It is so that we might know Jesus and know his heart and know the message and understand the harvest and then go as laborers in the harvest. You don't have to be smart to serve Jesus. You don't have to have a college degree to be used by God. You simply have to know Jesus, and God will use you as a laborer if you'll go forth. The goal of discipleship is to raise up laborers for the harvest. And it doesn't matter whether you're serving as a camp counselor in student ministry, preparing a meal to take to the homeless with Hope Beyond Bridges, or putting together a backpack for backpack buddies, unmuting a microphone during a worship service, holding a door open for people as they come in, holding and snuggling a baby who's crying in the nursery, cutting out crafts on Thursday as a volunteer for the kids' ministry, teaching a group of fourth graders, leading an outreach event, serving in AV or the media, singing on a worship team, teaching from the platform, serving in our communications team, it doesn't matter if you're serving as an elder. You're walking in the grounds for our safety team. It doesn't matter whether you're part of a missions team or teaching team. Our drive and our heart and our prayer and our mission in everything that we do, whether it be in the eyes of man, huge or insignificant, the heart and the drive and the thing that we pursue more than anything else is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's why we serve. We preach Jesus so that he might be lifted up and men might be drawn to him. I'll wrap up in the book of Acts if you'll find Acts chapter 1. In the book of Acts, we find God's people released to multiply the gospel to the ends of the earth. And when you read the book of Acts, you find the stories of the early church. Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 13 they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, and the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them, and they sent them off. And those people took the gospel on their missionary journeys, and everywhere they went, 
Jesus was revealed and people believed. In Acts chapter 8, Philip was serving in the church in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 26, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And this is a desert place. And Philip obeyed what what the Lord called him to do. And while he was there, he met a eunuch who was reading out of the book of Isaiah. And while he was reading out of the book of Isaiah, Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can someone, how can I know and understand unless someone guides me? And the Bible tells us that Philip began at that scripture from the book of Isaiah. And he didn't preach to him about the church and he didn't talk to him about a discipleship process. He started at that scripture and he preached unto him Jesus because that's what heals the brokenness in our world. And in that moment of obedience, Jesus was revealed and the eunuch believed. Peter was released by Jesus. You'll remember after the resurrection that Jesus had a conversation with Peter in John chapter 21 and told him what he wanted him to do. And in Acts chapter 3, there's a, a lame man at the beautiful gate and Peter and John are passing by and they speak the name of Jesus and they speak healing into this man's life and he's healed. And God used that moment in Acts chapter 3 and verse 14, Peter stood up and he said and declared to everyone who would listen, but you denied the holy and righteous one, speaking of Jesus, and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you, that's Barabbas, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. And to this, to this, Peter said, we are witnesses of the resurrected Jesus and his name by faith in his name has this man uh, has made this man strong whom you see and know and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all you all God used that moment and Peter revealed Jesus to the crowd and in Acts chapter 4 and verse 4 but many of those who heard the word what word the word about Jesus what did they do they believed And the number of the men came to about 5,000. Jesus was revealed. People believed. So in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to restore us to a place of prominence and power? Verse 7, Jesus said to them, It's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. You will testify of me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus tells his disciples, stop worrying about the signs of the kingdom and the signs of the time. Why are you gazing up into heaven? What did he say? You got a mission. Go and take the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth. The end of our discipleship process is not to raise up a bunch of Bible Jeopardy champs or even a lot of good Christians. It's to raise up laborers for the harvest. It's to raise up high school students who can go into their schools and make a difference and shine the light of Jesus to their classmates. It's to raise up a generation of moms and dads who can disciple their children to love and to follow Jesus with their lives. It's to raise up disciples of Jesus who can go into their workplace and share the love of Christ with those that they work with. It's to raise up laborers into the harvest. You see, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, the the kingdom of God is not about addition. It's releasing to multiply. To get the gospel to the ends of the earth, we have to multiply. So part of our equipping here at the brook is going to model the life of Jesus. There'll be times you're brought into ministry and you'll be, you'll be shown, hey, let me show you how to do this. And then there'll be times where we'll say, hey, all right, now it's your turn. You do it. And we'll be right there with you and walk alongside you. That's discipleship. And then there'll be a time where we say, hey, go and do it. God's gifted you. God's equipped you. God's called you. He's taken the leash off the harness, right? Released to the work that God has called you to do. And our prayer at the brook is that in all that we do, two things will happen. Jesus will be revealed and people will believe. Right now, we have over 20 people who have committed their lives to Christ and wanna be baptized. That's unbelievable to me. That's incredible. 
And what that shows me is that the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So will you join me today in prayer and begging God to send laborers into into the harvest? And will it be a personal prayer for you? God, send me. Will you stand with me with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and we'll pray. Father, we beg of you to send us forth into the harvest as laborers for your glory and for your honor. The need is immense, but we ask you to use us, God. Use us to see lives change with the gospel of Christ. Thank you for Caleb, who's given his life to you and today is gonna tell his family and friends and his church family that he believes in Jesus and that he wants to follow you with his life. Thank you for that. We praise you for the others who've given their lives to you, but are waiting for that moment where they can share the gospel through baptism with their friends. We pray for a great harvest here at the brook and around the world. And we pray, we ask you, God, we beg you to send us forth as laborers into the harvest. Use us as you see fit. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.